Hello everyone, today we're going to prove a very useful identity that links epsilons to deltas, where the epsilons that I'm referring to are the levi civita symbol or the alternating symbol, and the deltas that I'm referring to are the Kronecker delta. Now I'm not going to give a full introduction as to what those are, but in brief, here are the definitions. Um, the levi civita symbol epsilon subscript i, j, k is 1 if your i, j, and k indices are an even permutation of 1, 2, 3. Right, so what that means is that epsilon 1, 2, 3, and epsilon 3, 1, 2, and epsilon 2, 3, 1, those are all 1. If instead you have an odd permutation of 1, 2, 3, meaning if you have something like um, epsilon 1, 3, 2, or epsilon um, 2, 1, 3, or epsilon 3, 2, 1, those are all minus 1. And if you have any different combination of indices, then it's zero. So basically what that means is if any two of them are the same, then it's zero. Okay. The delta ij, the chronic delta, is a bit simpler in that it's just one if the two indices i and j are the same and it's zero otherwise. And the identity that we are aiming to prove is basically linking the product of two epsilons to the determinant of a matrix filled with various deltas. Okay, so we multiply together epsilon ijk and epsilon lmn, and I'm saying this is equal to this determinant of this matrix where the deltas in the top row all have an index of i, and in the second row they have an index of j, and in the third row they have an index of k. Similarly, the columns, right, the first column there is a common index of l, second column there's an index of m, and the third column there is an index of n. Now, the way I'm going to prove this is just by noting um, a couple of useful facts about these two sites. So the first thing um, to note is that if any two of i, j, k, or any two of l, m, and n are equal, then what can we say? Well, by definition of epsilon i, j, k, the left-hand side is going to be zero, right? Because that's this, this kind of otherwise case. How about the right-hand side? Well, if any two of i, j, and k are the same, then what we would have is that two of the rows of this matrix would be the same. Um, and if you take the determinant of a matrix with two equal rows, then you get zero. One way to think of that is that um, the determinant represents the volume um, of the parallel pipette, um, which is defined by the rows or, or columns of your um, matrix. Okay, and so if two of them are the same, then your this parallel pipette reduces to a uh, 2D shape, which doesn't have any volume. So basically, if you take the determinant of a matrix and two of the rows are the same, um, then uh, you you get zero. Uh, similarly, if any two of L, M, and N are equal, well, by definition, the left-hand side is also zero, but then two of the columns in the matrix uh, would be the same, and you would also get zero as your determinant for the determinant for the same reason. Okay, so if any two of either of these sets of indices are equal, um, then we can say that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are both zero. Okay, so this identity works in that case. Okay, so how about for other cases? Well, let's consider the simplest possible case first. So let's say if i, j, k, i, j, and k are 1, 2, and 3 in that order, um, and also l, m, and n are 1, 2, and 3 in that order, then what do we have? Well, the left-hand side is epsilon 1, 2, 3 times epsilon 1, 2, 3, which we've already said is 1, right? So let me just write that out in full. Epsilon 1, 2, 3, epsilon 1, 2, 3, which is 1 times 1, which is 1, okay? How about the right-hand side? Um, well, it's going to be the determinant of some matrix. And, well, what are these various deltas going to be? Well, the first uh, index of these two epsilons are the same, right? So i and l are the same. So delta i l is 1. Similarly, the second index um, of both of these epsilons is 2. So they're the same. So j and m are the same. So the middle entry is 1. And similarly, um, we have a 3 in the final position of both of these epsilons. So we get a 1 down there. And the rest of the entries are all going to be 0. So this is just the identity matrix, and so we can write down that that is also equal to 1. So in that case, when i, j, k, and l, m, n are both 1, 2, 3, uh, the identity works in that case. Now, 
this is where the kind of interesting part of the argument happens. Um, basically, what we want to do is note that we can get um, from, if we kind of think of this epsilon 1, 2, 3, epsilon 1, 2, 3 um, as a starting point, we can get from that particular combination of indices um, to any non-zero uh, combination of indices. Um, we can do that by just swapping, um, swapping within uh, the set of indices i, j, and k, um, and or within the set of indices l, m, and n, right? So for example, um, we could exchange i and k, okay? And we could exchange like m and n, and we can do that either once or twice, and we'll be able to get from epsilon 1, 2, 3, epsilon 1, 2, 3 to any other um, combination of indices. The reason we don't have to consider swapping between i, j, k, and l, m, n, like the reason we don't have to think about what would happen if we swapped um, j and n is that if we did that, we would end up with two indices in one of our epsilons being the same, and then we'd get back to zero. Okay. And um, we've already covered that case in, in the first point up here, right? So if we start from epsilon 1, 2, 3, epsilon 1, 2, 3, we can, by a series of swaps between i, j, and k, and or l, m, and n, we can uh, change the indices um, to, uh, to whatever we want. Right, and so why is that a useful thing to consider? Well, it's because from the definition of epsilon i, j, k, we know that the left-hand side right, the left-hand side um, is anti-symmetric. It's anti-symmetric, in other words, it just changes its sign um, under this operation, right? If you swap two of the indices, and you only do that once, okay, then you're going to change, change your sign. Okay, now what about the right-hand side? Well, it's also a property of the determinant that if you swap two of the rows, or two of the columns, you keep the same magnitude of the determinant, but you uh, you change its sign. Okay, and so if we swap um, within the i, j, k indices, we would be swapping around two of the rows. Similarly, if we exchange indices within l, m, and n, we would be swapping over two of the columns. And so the right-hand side is also anti-symmetric under that operation. So, so is the right-hand side. Um, and we can actually conclude from that that the left-hand side is always equal to the right-hand side, okay? Um, which is because we can start, we consider this one case, right? Simple case where i, j, k, and element are 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, and we showed that we can get from there to any other non-zero um, configuration of indices by a finite number of these swapping operations, but we showed that the left and the right-hand sides change in exactly the same way if we do those swapping operations. So they always stay always stay the same. Okay, so in that sense, I kind of think of this as, it's not really mathematical induction, I guess, but it, I think of it as being kind of similar because we kind of consider this base case um, of 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, and then um, think about how to get from there to any other combination. So there is an argument um, for why this identity holds. It's very useful when we are trying to prove identities um, involving vectors, and I'll be saying a bit more about that soon.